Well, please do open your Bibles to Luke chapter 8, and uh, do take out the outline. Uh, you'll find it helpful as uh, we follow through this message this evening, and also encourage you to take notes. Good to do that. We leave a bit more of a blank in the outline to encourage you to jot down notes and things like that, uh, things that maybe uh, God is teaching you as uh, we study this passage together. And this evening, we are going to look at uh, verses uh, 40 through 48. Um, actually, this uh, particular text should really be uh, all the way to the end of the chapter, and that's why we read it uh, this evening, all the way through to the end, uh, because actually what it does is it incorporates two miracles, two healings. But we're only going to get what, through one this evening. Uh, we'll consider the second one next week. Now, in verses 40 to 48, we have another powerful account, an unforgettable account of Jesus healing someone. Now, we know, don't we, that the world, everything and everybody in it, is dying. Tragedy and sorrow, pain of life, is told in the endless and inescapable evidences of sickness and death. The fall of humanity has placed into the fabric of our universe the deadly force of death. We know that. It is, it is that which sends all people spiraling at times into sickness and all of us into death and the sorrow and the suffering that goes along with that. And nobody avoids that. No matter how advanced we become in science, no matter how sophisticated our medical technology becomes, at best, we are only able to postpone the inevitable. And of course, because God has made us for relationships and God has given us the capacity to love, there is, of course, associated with sickness and death, the immense grief and sadness that goes along with suffering. Now, Jesus understood all of that. Jesus stood at the grave of Lazarus, according to John chapter 11. And as he stood there, it says that Jesus wept. Now, he wasn't weeping particularly for Lazarus because he knew that he was about to raise him from the dead. He was, no, he was entering into the, the tears of all people of all time who had stood and will stand beside a grave with the sense of loss for their loved one. He understood the pain and the sorrow that stretches both forward and backward from that moment throughout all human history. And, is, and that is filled with this relentless pain of sickness and death. And the question, of course, to ask is, well, is there any hope? And we keep asking it medically. Uh, medical science has worked for a long time to find chemistry as an answer, and labs and test tubes and experiments has led to uh, all kinds of medication, and we're thankful for God that he gives men and women the skills and the gifts and abilities to, to understand these things, to discover all these things, and all these procedures that are, are made and are developed to, to try and stop disease and ultimately postpone death. And we've got involved in trying to restructure people's genetic code um, to try to stop this disease, or if there are too many negatives I I in their genetic code, to not even allow them to be born so we don't perpetuate uh, the pain and suffering of disease and death. And then, yeah, there are those people who want to freeze you. Can come across that? They want to freeze you until a cure is found for the particular uh, disease, and then they're going to bring you back in, in this, some kind of immortality. And all of this, of course, is simply a way to sort of stall off in some small way the inevitable. Because God's word tells us in Hebrews 9, 27, that it is appointed for man to die once. That is a reality. We know that. It is in the fabric of human life, and from that moment you are born, you begin the process of dying. And the cause of it all, as we well know, is sin. Genesis 3. So the question then is, well, is there hope? Is there an answer? And I'm here to tell you that there is hope. There is absolute hope. There is a healer who has the power to heal all diseases, and one day he will do that. In fact, there is one promise by the Old Testament prophets, the Messiah, the Savior, the Anointed One, the King who is to come, the Son of God, the Lord of Lords, that when he will come, he will introduce a new kind of life. He will come and create a new heaven and a new earth in which disease and death will be non-existent. There will be an eternal realm called heaven in which there will be no sorrow, no sadness, no pain, no tears, no sickness, no death forever. And this is the promise of God's word, the Bible. And the Bible also tells us that there's only one person who can do this. 
It will be a glorious and wonderful world, and ruling over it will be the one who has the power to create the world, the one who will recreate a new heaven and a new earth in which there will be eternal perfection and righteousness. The question is, who is this person? And who is the one who can do this? Who is the one who can give us such hope of healing, such hope of conquering death, such hope of eternal life without sorrow, pain and suffering? Who is this one? And the answer is there is only one and his name is Jesus Christ. Any other claimants to be one are frauds and fakes. They are not to be trusted. There is only one, and it is Jesus. And the New Testament is written to prove that it is him. The point of it all is to show that there is one who has come, born of a virgin, who lived a perfect and sinless life. Luke has already showed us that in chapter 8, hasn't he? That Jesus is the one who has demonstrated power over nature. He has control over the storm. He can control the wind and stop the waves in their tracks. This is the one who has power over demons. He has power over Satan to conquer him. He has power over disease. He has power over death. And we've already seen, haven't we, as we've been following over the last few weeks, we've seen up to this point in Luke's Gospel, we've been there when Jesus did many healings. Uh, We've been there when he raised the son of the widow of Nain right out of the coffin when he was being carried to to his burial plot. That was an interesting funeral, I guess. He raised him from the dead, didn't he? We have seen his power over death. And here we're going to see it again in another remarkable look at the amazing power of Jesus. Only this time we're going to go a little bit more deeply into the actual person of Christ. Because the statement that Jesus makes when he says at the end of verse 46, he says, I know that power has gone out from me. That is just a a riveting statement. You see, we go from seeing a miracle and hearing the story about a miracle to inside the Saviour, inside deity, inside the God-man. Not talking about how the lady who was healed felt, not talking about what Peter felt who blurted out his solution to the dilemma, not talking about what others who, who were there in the crowd were experiencing. No, we go immediately into finding what Jesus was feeling. And here is... I think the Bible gives us here, and Luke does here, one of those, those amazing glimpses that probably take us far into the nature of God as we can go. See, the miracles of Jesus are, so very, are there to verify that he is God. And this one gets up close and personal. Now, of course, a lot of people over the years have the desire to heal people. And I think probably... All of us here, if we're really honest, we have the desire to see people around us that we love healed. Of course we do. Why wouldn't we? There have been people through the years that have offered themselves as would-be healers. They had a desire to heal. A lot of them actually had a desire to make money at the expense of people who wanted to be healed. But there's just never been anybody who had the absolute power to heal. Only Jesus and those apostles to whom he delegated that power expressed it. And that's really the key. Two things are required if you're going to be the healer. One is that you have the desire to heal. That is that you care about suffering and pain and death. And the other is that you have the power to do it. And those those two things come together perfectly in Jesus Christ. But behind his healing power is that healing desire. And I just want to kind of this evening, kind of get in touch with that healing desire as we go through the narrative of the story. It's really a a, a miracle in a miracle. So we're going to kind of have a sort of sermon in a sermon this evening, I guess. So I want to point out the personal way in which Jesus engaged himself with people, because I think this is just fascinating. I think you see this here in this passage. And the first thing I think we see about Jesus here, following your outline, is that Jesus is accessible. That's really important to understand, that Jesus is accessible. Now, Jesus had been in this region of Galilee, in Gadara. He had gone over there to get away from the crowd, uh, but he, he never went alone. In fact, he, he had in his own boat the, the apostles, the disciples, and, and there most likely were other boats as well that w- went with him. Uh, and they had sailed, they sailed from Capernaum, which was kind of, it's kind of the headquarters of his Galilean ministry. Uh, they sailed about six miles across the northern portion of the Sea of Galilee to the, the Gentile eastern shore. 
And Jesus went over there to basically get some relief from the nonstop crush of the crowd, of the mob that never left him alone. I mean, he needed time, not just alone, but he needed time with his disciples, his students, the people whom he, he would explain the meaning of the parables to that he gave to the crowd. Jesus wants to encourage them. He wants to train them up. He, he knows what they will be doing in the future. And then Jesus then returns, and the crowd was right there where he had been. Verse 40 says this. Now, when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Now, this was a huge crowd. It would be a crowd of thousands of people. And in that crowd were people who hurt, all the people who suffered, all the people who had pain and sorrow, all the people who were disabled, all the people who couldn't hear, uh, who, who couldn't see, who had any kind of physical problem. They were all there waiting and waiting and waiting with, waiting with all their anxieties for Jesus to come back. And some of them were, were borderline panicky, such as the man Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, who had a 12-year-old daughter who was dying. And you can imagine, can't you? He had waited and waited and waited, wondering when Jesus would come back. He, his anxiety and his fear was probably reaching fever pitch at this point. And this is a kind of crowd that can't wait for Jesus to get back, to continue the healing while, which they had come to know him for. And that's what he did. You notice he didn't try to avoid them, did he? He, he stepped off the boat, and there they were. And that's where it was pretty much every day. And it tells us here of his accessibility. He was unlike many religious leaders over the years. He, he didn't seclude himself in some sort of ivory tower protected from people. His entire ministry was spent in public with the people, in the streets and in the fields and in their homes and, and in the synagogues and on the road and by the sea and, and in the boats. Wherever there were people, that's where he was. Only occasionally did he retreat to isolate himself for the purpose of, of giving instructions to those who believed in him to encourage his disciples. Even on some occasion he got away just for, for rest. He, he himself needed to restore his energy. And sometimes he just got away by himself because he needed time alone with his father. But always, when the morning came, he was back there and the crowd was there waiting for him. And that was all right because it was to them that he had come. It was to them he had to prove who he said he was. It was to them he had to preach the message that God would forgive their sins if they would cry out in humility for that forgiveness. And even though the crowd hounded him and dogged him and crushed him, and even though sometimes the crowd tried to kill him, he was accessible to them. He came back. And so when he came back, they were all there. Now, you have to understand that Jesus was a hero to these people. To them, he was the, the ultimate celebrity, if there was such a thing at that time. Uh, just like there he would be today if he came into the world and he literally banished illness. I mean, could you imagine if Jesus appeared and just illness disappeared everywhere he went? I mean, he would be the celebrity of all celebrities, wouldn't he? All the sick people from far and wide would be there with all their cases, endeavoring to push themselves up where he was. But that's what he needed to do because it was to the people that he had to present the message of forgiveness. He had to tell them that they were not just physically in distress... They also needed the forgiveness of God for their sins. And God would forgive their sins based upon the wonderful work that he would soon do upon the cross. He had to preach to the crowds, and that's what he did. He had to heal the people in the crowd and raise the dead to demonstrate that he was, in fact, the promised Messiah who could do all those things that the Old Testament said that the Messiah would do when he brought in his glorious kingdom. But at the same time, the crowd was fickle, wasn't it? It's the same crowd, incidentally, that screamed for his blood later on. They were looking for miracles. They were looking for solutions to human problems, to physical problems, maybe even social problems. There weren't many believers. It's interesting that the group of real disciples were relatively small, and in the midst of a crowd like this, there was anything from those who really believed in him as who he said he was, the promised Messiah, to those who, who hated him and were just sort of spying on him so that they could report back to the Pharisees and tell of some breach of, of Jewish tradition for which they could hold him responsible. But in the middle part of the crowd, of these two extremes, in the middle part of the crowd, there were just a sort of a, the miracle worker fans, you know? They were the sign seekers, if you like. 
All they wanted is more miracles, as if he hadn't done enough to prove who he said he was. And they were saying, show us evidence before we believe. Come on, show us another miracle. Show us some more evidence. Then, then we'll believe. And they had plenty of evidence. It, it wasn't that they had intellectual doubts. It wasn't that at all, in fact. They refused to admit their sin, but they wanted the miracles to keep coming. They didn't want to drive Jesus away. So on one hand, they refused his message, the message of the gospel, the message of salvation. And on the other hand, they just kept asking for more evidence, more miracles, please, Jesus. Do another trick for us, please. Keep the miracles coming. So they were all there, a mixed crowd. And then in verse 41, it says, then. Now, that's a kind of a jolt. You need to understand that as it's written there in, in, in Greek, it's a jolt. It, it's written as a sort of a surprise. There's a startling moment that happens here. Then, a man named Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house. Now, Matthew and Mark, the other gospel writers, they also record this account. There's a lot of coverage on this story because it's a really important one. And what makes it remarkable is the fact that this man, Jairus, is an official of the synagogue. He's a ruler of the synagogue. Now, that is as high as you can go in the local community social level. He was the man. He was the bigwig. You, you couldn't get higher than him. I mean, if you had chosen to be a ruler in the synagogue, that, that's the pinnacle of what it should be for you. And the most respected man who startlingly comes up... And you notice he, he bows down before Jesus. And I'll explain why that's such a shocking thing in a moment. But in contrast to that man, there is another woman, isn't there? We read about it earlier on. Two people out of this crowd that actually have legitimate faith. That man, he was a ruler of the synagogue and a woman who was an outcast. And you can see the contrasts are pretty clear, can't you? One is a man, one is a woman. Well, that's obvious. One is rich, one is poor. One is revered and exalted, the other is vilified and despised. One is respected, one is rejected. One is used to being honoured, one is used to being scorned. One has a 12-year-old daughter dying, and the other, interestingly, has a 12-year-old disease. One leads the synagogue, the other is excommunicated from the synagogue. And here you see the Saviour embracing the extreme. And this, in a sense, is a fulfilment of the Magnificat of Mary, when Mary was told that she was to be the mother of the Messiah, the Son of God. And one of the things that she said, recorded in Luke 1.52, is this, is that he, the Messiah, has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. Well, there you go. This is what's happening here. Here's a perfect illustration of that. He brings down a ruler, and he lifts up a humble person. Here is the ruler. Here is the outcast. But let's look at the ruler first of all, because this is pretty startling. This is, well, it's incredible for an official of the synagogue to do this, to come to Jesus and to bow down before him. He is a man, you see, of great respect. He will be mature spiritually. He will be devoted to the Lord, at least in the religion of Judaism. He will be devoted to the people. He will be a leader of the people. He would be trusted in terms of wisdom, knowledge of the Old Testament. He would have the responsibility to take care of all the administration uh, of the synagogue, which was the local center of Judaism. He had the responsibility for all public services, which went on all through the week, as well as on the Sabbath. He supervised all activities, appointed all readers of the scriptures, all those that prayed, and all those that explained the scriptures. This man had tremendous responsibility in the synagogue there in Capernaum. All religious responsibility aside, though, he has been reduced to a grief-stricken father. All of the level of responsibility... He is full of grief, as a father would. And he falls at Jesus' feet, verse 41 says, and he began to beg him to come to his home. All he cares about is that he get to Jesus and get Jesus to his daughter. He doesn't care about anything else. That's all he cares about. Now, we need to understand that Jesus has done many miracles in Capernaum, of which this man would have had knowledge of. In the very synagogue of Capernaum, if you read chapter 4, verses 33 to 37, Jesus, and we looked at this, didn't we? Jesus had an encounter with a demon-possessed man. 
Jesus was sitting in the synagogue and all of a sudden a demon-possessed man screams, the, the demon takes over his voice and the man screams out, ha, what have, you to do with, what have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? And then the demon says, you, holy one of God. And the demon gives an accurate account, a testimony of who Jesus really is. Well, Jairus may well have heard of that and experienced that since the Sabbath attendance in the synagogue was mandatory. Particularly if you were the leader in the synagogue, if you were the elder, the, the chief ruler, you, you would be there. That's what you did. He had exposure to Jesus' power over demons because Jesus cast out the demons out of that man and that day, like, followed out by going home and later healing Peter's wife's mother from an illness and then followed that up by doing many other miracles. So this man had information about Jesus and he had come to believe that Jesus did have the healing power of God. Maybe he believed that Jesus' message was a true message too. And maybe he came not just as a man humbled by the emergency of his daughter's illness, but humbled by the reality of his own sinfulness. And he falls at the feet of Jesus and he begins to beg him. Now Mark, in his account, Mark 5.23, he tells us actually exactly what he said. He says, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. He wanted her well. Twelve years old. He had enough faith to believe Jesus could heal her. He even had enough faith to believe that Jesus could raise her from the dead, as we shall see. He's a rare man in the upper ranks of Jewish history. Very unusual to find a ruler of the synagogue believing in Jesus, believing in his power, and then humbling himself in this fashion before him. And it says, back in our passage in verse 42, that he had only one daughter. Notice, because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. And Luke is the only one who uses that word only, because it just increases the pathos, doesn't it? This was his only child, 12 years old, and she is dying. Her father says to Jesus, she's going to die. Please come, please come, I beg of you. Lay your hands on her. Let her live because she is dying. She's my only daughter. Can you imagine? How grateful he must have been for the accessibility of Jesus. Because Jesus was available to everyone. And that's really the second point. Because secondly, Jesus is available. Jesus is available. He was not only accessible, he was available. Now, accessible doesn't go far enough. Uh, accessible is, is a little superficial. It just means you're there. Available takes it another step, doesn't it? He wasn't just accessible in the crowd. He's available to a person. And that's in verse 42, the second part of the verse. And it simply says this, as Jesus was on his way. Now, what does that mean? Well, it simply means he went. He responds to Jairus. He could have said, well, Jairus, come on. Don't you know what I'm doing here? Don't you understand how busy I am here? I've got a lot of folks here that have got lots of needs. I can't just be carting off to your house, can I? Lots of people have problems. And it's interesting, isn't it, that Jesus was not just committed to crowds, he was committed to people. He was committed to individuals. And this is the way it is with the heart of God. He's not just concerned about the whole of humanity. He really cares about people. He cares about you and me. No ivory tower with Jesus, no monastery. God, as it were, pitched his tent with people. And he was available to individuals who had needs. Jesus cared about people. Jairus' heart was breaking. And one of that, whatever that Orthodox Jew thought about Jesus, whatever he thought about the religious authorities, whatever he thought that they might think about him falling before Jesus and believing that he could come and heal or raise his daughter was of no concern to him. His desperate need had motivated him. His belief in the power of Jesus had been demonstrated to him over and over and over again, and Jesus had literally banished sickness from the region of Galilee. It was that impact that he had made. And he came, Jairus came, and he engaged in his life personally with Jesus, and Jesus became available to him. Sure, his motives were mixed. It wasn't just because he wanted Jesus to put on the display and to prove that he was God. He wanted his daughter back. She was dying. But Jesus responded to his weak faith. 
to his mixed motive. Isn't that encouraging for us, by the way? Let's be honest. Our faith is weak at times, isn't it, when we pray to God? We, we have mixed motives at times, don't we? I mean, we try and sort of, I don't know, make it right when we pray, but God sees our heart and knows. And that should encourage us that Jesus responded to this man and he responds to his natural pain and this availability and this accessibility is due to one great attribute of God and that's God's compassion. God weeps. God feels the pain of suffering people and that's one of the great messages of the incarnation of Jesus. Jesus came into the world, God in human flesh, and he suffers because he cares. Matthew 11, 28 to 30, Jesus himself said this, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He was a comforter. He was a burden bearer. In fact, the prophet Isaiah said of him in Isaiah 40, verse 11, He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. That's the Messiah. He goes to the broken. That's compassion. Now, if all Jesus wanted to do is demonstrate that he was God, well, he could have done a lot of ways, he could have done a lot of things to prove that, couldn't he? I mean, he could... He could, for example, he could have just sort of, I don't know, fly up into the air, spin around a few times, you know, uh, fly across the Sea of Galilee like Superman would or someone like that, fly back down, do a few twirls, land back on his feet and go, da da I'm the Messiah. That might have been convincing. Uh, or he could have said cow and it would have been created. Or he could have said horse and he could have created that, or man or woman or whatever and created somebody. Or he could have said mountain be gone and all of a sudden it's just disappeared and it's flat. He could have done a lot of things. He could have done all of those sorts of things. Why did he do healings? Why did he do resurrections? Because he wanted to demonstrate not only his power, but that behind his power is his compassion. He's not only capable of creating a world that is free of disease and death, he not only has the power to do it, he has the desire to do it. And it's in his compassion. He is a compassionate saviour. And so he weeps over the grave as Lazarus because he feels the sort of reflected agony of all who will suffer the loss of a loved one. Let me show you. I could show you many, many verses of, that prove one, one, many, many times the compassion of Christ. Let me show you a few. Matthew 14, 14. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Mark 1, verse 4. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Mark 8, verse 2, Jesus says, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. Matthew 9, verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he looked over Jerusalem in Luke 19, verse 41, and he saw the city and he burst into tears. This is the compassion. And this is behind his accessibility, this is behind his availability, and he goes with Jairus. And that takes us to a a third sort of personal aspect of Jesus' work with people, and that is thirdly, Jesus can be interrupted. Jesus can be interrupted. Now that's a bit of a strange one, but we see that here, don't we? Look at verse 42. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. Now, he was trying to get to this man's house and the crushing crowd with all of these sick people uh, pushed around him. Uh, And, of course, some would be very immobile because many of them were paralyzed and and some of them were blind and some of them can't hear. And this crowd of sick people who, who I guess, can't move very fast, he's just pressing and crushing. And you can imagine it's very slow going. And this man's heart is racing because he knows his daughter is dying. Come on, Jesus, let's get there. Come on. And he's hoping Jesus is going to get there before she dies. Although later, in one final great act of faith, he says, I believe you can raise her from the dead if you want to. But his panic level is is just elevated because they can't get through the crowd. Just imagine that. And then, to make matters worse, verse 43 to 44, 
And a woman, a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. This is just, this is, if you like, just one of the faces in the crowd. And she becomes the interruption. And, and it didn't have to be that way. Jesus didn't have to call attention to this woman. She reached out, she grabbed his cloak, and at the end of verse 44 it says, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Great. Well, that's done then, isn't it? Fantastic. We can just all keep moving. Job done. Ah, uh, no. And we'll see a little more about that in a moment. It's interesting, isn't it? If you study the ministry of Jesus, that Jesus was always used to being interrupted. I mean, for example, he'd be preaching a sermon, and all of a sudden the roof would come apart, and down would come somebody in, in a stretcher in a bed. We learned that already in the Gospel of Luke. I mean, he used to, he's used to being interrupted. Everybody who wanted something interrupted him. It's amazing. No, no matter what he's doing, he literally would, he would literally turn to help that person. He's preaching Luke 12. He's preaching, it says in verse 13, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. I mean, I mean just think about that. Can you imagine some guy standing up in the middle of my sermon saying, hey, Pastor Phil, um, my brother and me, we're having a bit of a problem. Can you just tell us to decide who's going to have half of the money uh, and sort the money out of my I mean, really? He was interrupted all the time. I don't think I could handle that. But Jesus never had a problem of being interrupted with his train of thought. So don't be standing up and saying things when I'm trying to concentrate, okay? I'm working hard here. So, you know, I'll preach, you listen. We'll just keep our jobs as we should do, really. But, but Jesus was interruptible, if that's a word. Now, here is a panicky ruler on his hands, Jairus. He's trying to get through the crowd to get to this man's house in Capernaum. And all of a sudden, this woman who has some kind of female bleeding problem, we don't know what it is, something that had gone on for 12 years here, as long as Jairus' daughter was alive. Isn't that interesting? Do watch these little interesting nuggets that Luke puts in for us. Jairus and his family had had 12 years of the joy of having a daughter. This woman had had 12 years of suffering the contrast? Now we don't know what it was but it was enough to take up 12 years of her life and turn her literally into an outcast. Now the physical effects of that, what were they? Well it would be loss of blood all the time which would result in loss of strength, danger of death, severe physical effects. Worse maybe in some ways was the severe social effects. Leviticus 15:19 says, when a woman has her regular flow of blood, the impurity of her monthly period will last seven days, and anyone who touches her will be unclean till evening. So a woman's regular monthly cycle was used by God as an illustration of the need to be purified. It, it was a way that, uh, that God was to remind the people that they needed to, to be pure. And, and so a woman during this time would be seen as unclean, a, a sort, of, sort of symbol of spiritual uncleanliness of the heart as an illustration to the people. But this woman would never be able to do anything but ceremony be unclean because it went on for 12 years. And what happened when a woman was unclean ceremonially? Well, she couldn't go to the temple, she couldn't go to the synagogue, she couldn't be with her husband, she couldn't touch her family, she couldn't touch her children. She was considered ceremonially unclean that, and she would transmit that ritual uncleanliness, that symbolic uncleanliness to anybody she touched. Socially, she was out, even of her own family. And this was for 12 years. What an unbelievable situation. Sad, sad lady. Physical effects, social effects, and I think spiritual effects too. She couldn't go to the synagogue, so she never could be taught the word of God. She couldn't go and worship. She couldn't go and learn. She couldn't hear the word of God read because scrolls, remember, were locked up in the synagogue. And then it says she couldn't be healed by anybody. Verse 43 tells us that. Now, that's Luke. And remember, Luke is a doctor, so he has to protect the profession. So Luke says it's incurable. It couldn't be healed. Mark says in Mark 5, verse 26... She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors. Now, Mark obviously was not in the profession. Luke might want to have a conversation with him about that. And had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. Now, notice, she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors. Now, some of you might want to give a testimony to that, but we won't go there this evening. But, but you know what? 
She probably did, because the background of this, the, the Talmud said that this was a common problem, excessive bleeding like this for a woman. And so they had some cures, uh, and they were sort of legitimate cures, by legitimate doctors maybe, who, who would serve for the most part the rich, who could afford to pay. But on the other hand, there were some cures that were offered um, that just were way out. So, for example, some of the cures were carrying the ashes of an ostrich egg in a linen bag around your neck in, in, in the summer and a cotton bag in winter. Another one they believed would cure it was uh, is to carry a barley corn found in donkey dung. I mean, who comes up with these ideas? Ridiculous. So, of course, there were some false doctors, fakers around, who were going around, uh, and she would try that. She tried everything. Twelve years of suffering, she would try anything, wouldn't she? But nothing worked. None of it did any good. She couldn't get any help. It says that she spent all that she had. She had nothing left. She had no connection with her family. She couldn't connect with anybody in society. And she is in this terrible physical condition and also the stigma and the shame and the embarrassment associated with it. What a terrible situation to be in. But she's heard about the healing power of Jesus. And remember, she's at the other end of the social spectrum from, the, from Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue. She knows what the required boundaries are for her, but she's reached a point where she don't care anymore, does she? Like he didn't care anymore. He's going to go there, whatever the religious establishment thinks, he's going to fall on his face and he's going to plead to Jesus, the great healer, with the power of God to heal his daughter. He don't care what his friends and colleagues think and she's going to go there and she couldn't care less what's acceptable in the terms of tradition and the terms of the law. She's going to go to Jesus and she's going to bang her way through that crowd to the whole of the crowd so that she can grab hold of him. And she too is likely from that area. And she too would have heard about his healing power. And she comes up behind him. It says in verse 44, notice, hoping to avoid being unnoticed. And that's indicated down in verse 47 when the woman saw that she had not escaped the notice of Jesus. She was trying to be so quiet as she could be, as invisible as she could be in that crowd. Just kind of working her way through, coming up behind because of natural embarrassment, fear of public shame, she comes in this secretive way, and it says she touched the fringe of his cloak. Now, the Greek word here for touch means to fasten onto. It means to cling to, or to clutch, to grab, to hold on. This isn't just a sort of little tap and then run away sort of thing. This is a grabbing hold. This is a clutching. I mean, you've got to understand, this is 12 years of suffering. This is breaching all social etiquette to do what she did. And finally, she gets there, and this is her last final hope, and she just grabs hold. She just hangs on to his robe. And why did she do this? Well, because Matthew 9, 21, in Matthew's account, it says, she said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. She knew his power. She believed in him. She believed there was so much power flowing out of him that if she just got in the space, she would be healed. And she was right. Because it says, doesn't it, at the end of verse 44, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Just like that. Incredible. And you think, well, that would be that then. Not so. Because number four, fourthly, we see that Jesus is all-knowing. He is all-knowing. He knows all things. Uh, and we see, don't we, verse 45, Jesus. Who touched me, Jesus asked. Now, you know, when Jesus deals with people, he exhausts all of his energies and all of his efforts to the end of what needs to be done. He could have let the lady go on physically well, but there were some other things that he needed to take care of here. She, remember, needed to be restored socially. And that called for a public restoration and the testimony that she had actually been healed. And she needed to be restored spiritually to God, and only he was the only one who could affirm that. And so he is never short with people. His attention is inexhaustible until that which needs to be done is done. He never leaves things half done with people, does he? He never does, well, that'll do, and you work out the rest of it. No, he does everything that needs to be done. And so he says... Who is the one who touched me? Who was hanging on to me? Well, verse 45, when they all denied it, and they're all saying, well, it wasn't me, and it wasn't me, and of course Peter, 
Peter, of course, speaking for the other disciples who were all having a problem with Jesus, even asking the question, as the other gospel writers tell us, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. Jesus, what are you talking about? Come on. I mean, you're being knocked from every side. There's loads of people around you. What do you mean who's touched you? The disciples are critical, aren't they? But Jesus said, and here's the key, verse 46, someone touched me, I know that power has gone out from me. It wasn't a mystery to him. He knew who she was. He knew that. And when he said, who was clinging to me, he was calling for her to come out and reveal herself to everyone. Isn't that he needed the information? Because he knew. He just wasn't done with her yet. He knew who she was. And this is one of the most, one of the most profound things Jesus ever said. I was aware that power had gone out of me. It's a real insight from Luke. It's hard to understand, but, but try and listen to it like this. You see, the power of God is not impersonal. It is, a, it is personal in the nature of God, and when the power of God flows from him to you, he feels the flow. That's an incredible thought, isn't it? His life pours into us. We feel that power, that infusion of spiritual power into our lives, and we see it evidence in our life. Do we ever think that God feels it? Well, our Lord personally felt the outflow of his power, his creative power to recreate that woman's inside. And it's hard to understand. I'm not sure we can fully understand it, but we do need to understand that, that God is not impersonal. God is not detached from our lives. When God touches a life and power flows, he feels the flow. He feels it. No one receives the power of God into his or her life without personal involvement from God. We are saved and the power flows. We are sanctified and the power flows. We are glorified and the power flows. And it is a living, intimate, personal union of life, our life, with the living, eternal God, and he feels the flow in our life. This is the personal power of God flowing into us. He's personally involved in our life. And he completes what he starts. And she couldn't hide, could she? She comes trembling, trembling under the weight of realizing she was in the presence of God. She falls down before him in reverence and worship. Verse 47, then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been, noticed, instantly healed. Now the social part has been taken care of. Jesus then says to her, verse 48, then he said to her, daughter. And that's the only time in the New Testament he ever called a woman by that name. Isn't that amazing? Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. He wasn't done with her yet. She needed to be restored physically. She needed to be restored socially. And she needed to be restored spiritually. Your faith has saved you, he says. Go in peace. You have made peace with God. Listen. You need to understand, Jesus knows you. He knows all about you. He personally knows you. He knows your hurts. He knows your, he your needs. He knows everything going on in your life. The trials and the sorrows, the joys and the great things. He knows, and he knows what will happen before you experience it. He knows everything about you. Isn't that a great encouragement to us? That when we feel lonely, when we feel uh, that we, no one under, really understands, or when we don't understand why things happen in our lives, or what is going on, and we don't know the answers, and we seek out advice from others, and it just doesn't seem to cut anything with us, and all of those sorts of things, he knows us. He knows how we feel. He knows absolutely everything about us. And he is accessible to us. He is available to you. He's not some distant person that has, you know, a big, you know, take a number and I'll see you in a million years. We have instant access to God through Christ, through prayer. He is available, he is accessible, he is all-knowing, and he is inexhaustible in meeting your needs. You can never have enough that God says, oh, I've run out now, you've got to wait until next week until I get to more power. It is inexhaustible, and it is personal with him. 
He feels the flow of power into your life. This is our goal to manifest in Jesus Christ. So what have Jairus' daughter then? Well, you're going to have to come back next week to find out what happened. Let's pray. And our Father God, we do want to thank you just for the, this wonderful passage of scriptures. We see the power of Christ at work. We see the pa- compassion of Jesus. We see the fact he's available, that he's accessible, that he knows all things. And Lord, what an encouragement that is. And for those of us perhaps who feel at times that uh, people don't fully understand us or they don't know what we're going through, we thank you that we have one, Jesus Christ, who knows every single thing about us. He knows our hearts, he knows our fears, he knows our sorrows, he knows the things that excite us and thrill us. He knows what will happen to us tomorrow, next week, next year. Nothing surprises him. And he knows how we will feel and he knows how we will face it because he is the all-knowing God. And Lord, we thank you that this Jesus, the all-powerful one, is our saviour, is our restorer, our rescuer, and he is our friend. We sing that old hymn, don't we? What a friend we have in Jesus. And we thank you that he bears our sins, but he knows us. And that we can bring everything to him in prayer. What a wonderful privilege that is. And Lord, as we'll see next week, the power of Christ isn't finished yet because as he does this incredible work in the lives of Jairus and particularly his daughter, it again will thrill us once again about his amazing healing power. Father, we thank you too that that one day there will be a time when Jesus returns where there will be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more suffering. That the great healer will have done his completed work. We long for that day. We thank you that day awaits us. We pray that in the meantime, we would bring all things to him because he knows our hearts and knows what we need. And he will give us exactly what we need at the right time. Always enough, never anything less. He is inexhaustible in how he deals with us. And we thank you for what a wonderful privilege that is to know him personally. Lord, we praise you and we thank you for what we've learned. Bring us back next week as we find out the rest of the story. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.